welcome back to Getting to the Top, where we introduce, introduce you to transformational leaders about their leadership journey in hopes that we either inspire you on your own journey or we help you to decide that you want to pursue leadership yourself. Certainly, we hope that you learn something along the way and that you're enjoying our interviews with these incredible people. Today, I have the honor of having with me Kiran Maraj. She's the president and co-founder of the Nonprofits Media Institute of the Caribbean, headquartered in Jamaica, and the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. She currently serves on the advisory council of the OAS Center for Media Integrity in the Americas. She's the senior vice president of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Commerce, also the managing director of several successful radio stations, including Heartbeat Radio 104.1 FM, which she founded as the world's first radio station for women. She's the former president of the Trinidad and Tobago Publishers and Broadcasters Association, among many other accolades. So welcome and thank you so much for being with us today, Kiran. Thank you very much, Raquel, for the opportunity and thank you for what you do. You, you let some of us share our stories with the hope that we'll inspire others. So thank you for creating that opportunity. Yes, so I wanna ask, start by asking you to introduce yourself in your own words. So we already talked about all of the amazing things that you founded, but, but please tell us a little bit more about you. Um, hmm. I'm not gonna tell you anything professional because you've covered that. But um, I will tell you that I consider myself an entrepreneur, a perpetual student, and a girl at heart. Mm -hmm. I think those are the important things to know about me. Wonderful. So tell us about your, your journey. So how did you start? What was your upbringing like? Um, very rooted in family values okay. and in a belief in God and, um, and, and the universe. And so I have to tell you that a lot of, of where I am today is a result of my parents mm. um, and then my sisters and then my son. But I, I often tell people that, you know, I think the ways of the world I learned from my father and the humility of heart I learned from my mother. Mm. And I think that has helped me have a balance. So I tend to do a lot of things like I can't sit alone and be in one space doing the same thing day in, day out. I get bored very, very quickly. And I always feel like I have to be doing something to create change that is gonna help somebody else, you know. Um, I've always been like that, even in my secondary school life. And I went to school in Holy Faith Convent in Cuba. Mm. So, you know, and at that time we were fortunate. We had a lot of nuns apart from, you know, just regular teachers, but um, they, it was a, a lot of discipline and I think that they really taught you to believe in yourself and to be empowered, you know. Yeah. And so I grew up in that kind of environment and I had two sisters younger than me, but my mother is one of nine children. She has, uh, so she has seven sisters, you know. So a lot of women and um, I think all of them were very independent. My grandmother on my father's side, very independent as well. And dad has two sisters. So I was very fortunate, I think, to have come from that kind of a home. And um, we, ha we had a very uh, mixed family. So a lot of um, multi-ethnic marriages and multi-religious marriages, inter-religious, you know? So that helped me to really be a true trainee. <laughs> Wonderful. But you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm realizing that like a lot of the successful women that I've interviewed are big sisters. So I wonder if that had a lot to do with it. You're setting an example for others. You know that others are looking up to you. Um, how far apart are you in age from your younger siblings? Yeah, so I'm um, the one after me, three years difference. And then my baby sister, five years difference. I've always felt like my baby sister was my child. I still feel like that. <laughs> she knows that. She takes advantage of it sometimes. Um, my mom had me when she was really young. She was 18. Wow. And I always feel like my, my mom and I grew up together to a certain extent. You know, she came from a very sheltered home. Um, my father was the one who I think pushed us to be out there and to get out there and do what you want to do. Um, and mom was always, but you have to learn all these other things too. You have to learn how to cook and you have to learn to do things around the house and you know. So um, yeah, but it, it was great. It is great actually being a big sister and I'm very close to them. And um, I hear about siblings squabbling and I can't even understand why or how. 
wow. because we don't have that. We will still all lay on a bed together and look at television. The three of us, you know, that's lovely. So, so you're, you're growing up. So what was the first thing that you thought of in, in terms of career? What, what was your first aspiration? I was going to be a poet. Oh, that is, want, this is a new <laughs> one for me. This is, I wanted to be me. a female D.H. Lawrence. That was my dream. Wow. <laughs> I wanted to be a female D.H. Lawrence. And I remember, um, in form three in Trinidad, you know, we have to choose our subjects. We go into arts or sciences. I was always an A student because I am a nerd. And um, my father looked at the teachers and said, she's going to be a doctor. So she's going to have to do sciences. I see. And my mother knew I was disappointed. And, you know, and I said, but dad, I want to write poetry. And he said, do you know that these people don't make money until after they're no longer on this earth? And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> um, so I did sciences. I went into form six. I wanted to go into form six. Did well in sciences, but I decided no. For form six, I wanted to do the arts. Okay. And um, my principal back then, Miss Pamela Punch, she said you can only come back to school if you did the Cambridge O level history, geography, and lit on your own. And you got all E's. Then I'll okay. take you back into form six. So that's what I did. Okay. I did it. I studied on my own for a year. I had the teachers at convent who, who gave me private lessons. And I got all E's. And I went back in. I went in to do arts. Okay. And um, after that, I went to UE. I did. Um, so while at UE, I was also doing my CIM in marketing. Because I wasn't. I, I started to feel like I wanted to do business. And so I did literature and I made up all of my electives would be some political science, a minor in political science, a major in literature. And then I did my CIM, Chartered Institute of Marketing. So I had that degree. So I was going to, to UE and another school at the same time. Um, and yeah, and that was my first degree. So as I said, I hardly ever sit still. So what inspired you to pursue business? Um, because, you, you know, you were going to be this poet and then you know, on the other side, this doctor that your father wanted you to be. And then you decided, no, the third path is business. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize I had a knack for business. I love marketing because I think I'm a creative person by nature. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up in my father's business, which was film. He was in film distribution okay. and then he went into film production. But, you know, daddy did feature films for the foreign market. Okay. You know, he had an office in Los Angeles, you know. He had his colleagues in New York. He had offices in the Philippines. So I grew up in that kind of environment. And his parents were in film distribution. So we've always had that creative aspect to our family. So marketing is what I wanted to do. I landed my first job because it was a, it was supposed to be a summer job. Mm -hmm. I graduated from UE. And I said, okay, I need to find a job. And there was this radio station that was looking for people to do things like produce some of their segments and do sales. And I said, look, it'll give me an opportunity to do something. So I got the job and I started off there in sales and helping them with some of their features. And um, the summer job became an opportunity to manage the station. So apparently the CEO How then... How did you go from the summer job to managing the station? <laughs> You're going to have to explain the, that. <laughs> the station was not doing really well. The format was really... I, I don't even know how they ended up with that format. It was Bollywood music with English music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would hear artists like Latham and Gishkar, and then you would follow it by Elvis Presley. And I was like, this is not working, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but somehow I was, I was making little sales, and I had a yellow legal pad. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I spoke to people everywhere about their choice of music when I was doing sales. So I would talk to customers at the supermarket. You know, I would talk to people on the main roads. You know, I would talk to business owners. And what I really ended up doing was writing a, a restructuring plan okay. on a yellow legal pad. I had another job off at another media house that I thought was more of what I wanted to do because journalism is really where I felt I would have landed. And, um, and I did do some journalism training and internship with Newsday and all of that. So, you know, and so I said, okay, I went to the CEO and I said, here's my yellow legal pad. And these are all the things I think you need to do to get this station right. And I'm leaving because I have another job. And he said, well, could you give me a little time? He read it. Yeah. He, read, he, he, you know, 
He said, sit down, let me read this. And afterwards he said, could you stay with us for a couple of weeks till we find other people? And I said, sure, I don't think, you know, my other um, would be employer would mind. And so he came to me afterwards and after the couple of weeks and he said, um, I want to offer you an opportunity to manage the radio station. That's amazing. And I, I looked at him, I said, you do know I'm only 23 years old, right? And he said, well, look, we think that we want to take the risk. It was the hardest decision of my life. Really? Because at age 23, um, you want to go out and you want to party and you want to hang out with your friends and, and you don't really want to think about business, you know? And then I thought, oh gosh, I have to stop clubbing because I don't want to be clubbing, <laughs> you know, and then having to deal with clients and what if people see and, and I was like, hmm. But then I said, at age 23, if I fail for some reason, big yeah. deal. Yeah. I'm young enough. I could let it go and I could move on. Right. So um, I asked my, my dad what he thought. And he said, well, why wouldn't you want to do it? Yeah. Because he started his career really young. Okay. You know, and, um, and I said, okay, I'll try it. And that was it. Um, I went from managing that one radio station I turned it around completely. It became Trinidad's leading Bollywood station. Fabulous. Um, and, you know, I did that in a four and a half year period. I I got rid of, of the losses we had incurred. So I just had a knack for it that I didn't even recognize. But apparently my then CEO, Peter Ames, he obviously saw it in me. And I had the opportunity to, to be groomed by a lot of other business people. I, I became... Um, the president of the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. I was 26 when that happened, but there were people like Max Senhaus um, and Rohan Sinanan who were my mentors, you know, who spoke to me a lot and taught me a lot. Richard D'Souza, who was the then CEO of Flavorite Foods, you know, he's no longer on this earth with us, but would spend a lot of time talking to me. And I think that was probably uh, my best learning ground. I had those kinds of mentors. And so um, how did you how did you learn about the business? Because you are coming out of school. Yes, you would have been sort of seeing your father running a business, but learning about profit and loss. You you had come from sales. Yes, you understand about revenue, but but how do you understand about payroll and budgets and all of that other stuff? I sapped up as much information from anybody around me who was willing to offer it. Mm -hmm. And I started my MBA at the same time. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm a bookworm, so I believe in reading, and I read quite a lot. And um, and I started to teach myself things when I didn't know. I every opportunity there was to go on a conference, and I could afford it. I went, you know, and I got to to really know the business. And so that went from from me working for the conglomerate that had owned that station and Music Radio Nine Seven mm -hmm. um, to um, buying the the radio group with my dad. Um, you know, my father said he felt that it was a good, because my sisters were involved by that time as well. And he said, this could be a good family business and you know it well and you've built it up. And, and you know, and it just went into launching the world's first radio station for women as Heartbeat Radio. And, um, and, and that was it. So it's now a family business and, um, and I love it. And I refuse to give up my sales and marketing because I love talking to our clients and I love interacting still with listeners and, you know, and, and that's, that's where I am. So, um, that gave me the opportunity to, to do a lot of nonprofit work, Wonderful. work with a lot of community, which I, which I thoroughly enjoy. Mm -hmm. I enjoy working with NGOs. I enjoy giving support. Um, I still do some mentoring, you know, um, I still continue with my journalism because I went on to do many other, many other, um, I don't want to say degrees. I did some degrees, but I also did a lot of certifications and different things to understand every aspect of the business. So at, whether it was events management at NYU, I did, or, you know, my Harvard um, executive education um, certificates in, in digital strategy and media strategy and all those things. Um, but I continue to learn. To invest I in continue yourself. to have an open mind. Yeah. Yeah. And so what kind of leader are you? What, you know, and, and how and how has that changed from the beginning to now? I think I I think I'm determined. I'm a determined leader. 
um, I lead a little bit with my heart, which is not always a good thing. I've been burned by it quite a few times. But I think I've developed some wisdom as far as, as strategizing and listening better. I've always been a listener. I like to listen to people to understand them. And, um, and I find that that has helped me very well in my leadership role mm -hmm. because people are not always what they seem. Situations are not always what they seem. You always have to go you know, behind the curtain to see what's going on. But I would say now I'm, you know, I've continued to be determined, but definitely um, to continue to be a good listener and be a little more of a strategist. Now, tell me about, tell me about the listening, because, you know, it's, it's sometimes I think it's hearing what people don't say. It is listening, listening to understand versus listening to respond. And so how, how did you, how did you determine that that was the thing that you needed to do? How did you realize that it was important? And how did you develop that skill? When I had to send home my first employee, wow. whose wife was in hospital with cancer. Um, and at the age of 23, to have to do that was um, very, very emotional for me. Yeah. Because he, he just was not the person that was cut out, but he was such a good person. Yeah. And, you know, and my CEO said, you need, you need to let him go because we're actually doing him an injustice when this is really not the thing for him. Yeah. And, um, I decided to help him look for another job, you know, yes. so, yeah. so, so, you know, and I started to, and I think listening, listening, Listening really helped me to do that because most people would say, if this is a directive from your CEO, you have to do it. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. I could not do that. That's why I said, you know, I also listen with my heart, which is not always a good thing, but I think it's a necessary thing, in, especially in today's world. But back then, that was the first lesson. And I realized there is a way to have this balance. Yeah. You know, in certain instances, you have to ensure that you, you have this balance. You can't just fly off the cuff and do things without rationalizing in it and without being able to sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I've always said that, you know, it's never been difficult for me to, to fire people because everyone is extraordinary at something. And so yes. if someone is not performing in your organization, then it is likely you're either not providing them with the right tools, you're not providing them with the right support, or this is not a good fit. And when, when the organization is unhappy, chances are they're unhappy as well. And so, you know, you need to be able to release them to go find the thing that they're going to do better than anybody else. And yeah. sometimes that's hard, but I cannot imagine a situation where someone has a wife in the hospital with cancer and that not just tearing your heart into pieces. Yeah. And, and it's not just that. I think I, I developed a, a skill where I'm part of my team. Mm -hmm. My team understands only one captain could steer the ship. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I see a piece of paper on the floor or I see the bin, you know, not under the desk where it's supposed to be, I will pick up that piece of paper. I will move the bin. Yeah. Right. And I think that um, from very early, my staff realized that that is how I am. And so it was more of a family feeling, mm -hmm. you know, in my organization. I mean, everybody who had a baby would know that I would have wet wipes and I would have diapers. And if you had children, I have crayons and coloring books. I had an announcer who, you know, who had a baby. And I know that she it was very hard for her. If she came off there, she would be without a job. Right. And but she had nobody to look after the baby. So the crib was in my office, literally, Aww. you know, and so and we had a lot of women in our office, you know, and people with kids. And I would tell them, just bring the kids and just put them on the table in the kitchen and, and keep them busy, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that was the environment um, that I created. So that that's why I said, you know, my leadership style, I also lead with my heart in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then about being strategic, how did that come about? Like, you know, it seemed like you were strategic out the gate. You, you came up with this plan, you know, early no. in business. Radio no. is very competitive. <laughs> so you had to be innovative. You still have to be. Mm -hmm. If you're not innovative and very certain of how you deploy the little resources you have, you're not going to win this game. Mm -hmm. And I learned from every client 
that has come through the radio station who I've interacted with. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn, you know, from people in small business to people in very big business. And that to me was, was an excellent opportunity for myself. And I realized that the more successful people have strategy built in. Mm -hmm. They probably don't realize it, but what I realized, this was their strategy. And so I realized, okay, very, you know, from very early on, I had to deploy my sources carefully um, because I am not a conglomerate, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't have a well full of dollars and I need to be very, very specific with what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how the strategy came. And that's not something you learn overnight. No yeah. school and no book is going to teach you that. You have to like be in the game and get to that point. So what's the best advice you've gotten then? Don't ever give up your dreams if you believe you can make them happen. Ah. Who was that? that? That was my my grandmother, my oh. father's mother, who's um, who passed. Mm -hmm. But she, um, because she had a, a difficult life as a single mother, um, with four children, went through a very hard time, and you know, and all her children did quite well, and um, and that was her belief, and I think that that was the best advice ever. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm sure there were times that you had to sort of draw on that advice and say, you know, stick with it. But it's, but you know, were there tough times during this this process? I know it's really competitive. Tell me about one of the tough times. There are so many tough times. Um, I think the toughest time was in the start because you didn't have cash flow to pay all of the bills, mm -hmm. and some of the sacrifices was I just wouldn't draw a salary maybe for a month or two months, you know. Yeah. Um, some of the other sacrifices is, is when I was having my son, you know, um, I'm still, I'm still trying to make ends meet and still build this business, you know, and, um, and thinking, okay, a baby's on the way. So how do you do this? You know, and you always want to give the baby everything, yeah. you know, <laughs> so you cut back on things for yourself. But I think that in the start, some of the serious sacrifices is, is the hours you have to put in. There would be times and there are still times I'm in the office from as early as 5 a.m if necessary. And I will just go straight through the day, you know, even up to this day, I hardly sleep. But the thing is, I think I have more balance than I had previously, because I think I'm getting old and I realize I have to balance it. Um, you have a lot of naysayers when you're a young woman yeah. in business, a lot of naysayers. And there were times when I got a lot of pushback on things I wanted to do, including from my father, who, you know, who was always my cheerleader. But there were times when he wouldn't think so, you know, so that when oh, I could prove, guess. prove yeah. him wrong, I would say, good, you know, I've had business people come to me and say they really thought I would have failed, you know, I would have fallen and not been able to get back up and, and they don't know how I did it. And, you know, and I, I take that as a pat on the back. So, yes, but I'm always cognizant that with every big risk I have to take, um, I'm, I don't look at anything as a failure. Okay. It was it was very difficult in the start because there were one or two projects that I, I started that did not go the way I intended. But you know, I realized it doesn't make sense beating yourself up for, for, from it. So I just started to actually write down. I like pen and paper. I love pen and paper, right? Up to this day. So I actually wrote down where did this go wrong and what do I need to not repeat? And so every fall is a lesson. Yeah. I don't have failures. I have falls and I get up and I go again. Yep. And they're very, very great learning experiences. So, and what yeah. is it like working with family? It has its moments. <laughs> some days are good. Some days are not so good. Um, but we love each other at the end of it all. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, we all know that we have very different ways of seeing things. But there are certain things where I, I know each of us actually, we know what the strengths are. My father is not involved in, in this, you know, in the radio business. Mm -hmm. um, my family is not involved in my nonprofits at all. Um, but at the radio stations, each of us, each of us as sisters know the strengths and we know the weaknesses. So we tend to, to leave them alone now. That comes with time as well. It's not the easiest thing. Does it bleed into your regular relationship? Or are you able to leave work at work? We have separate bedrooms for a reason, <laughs> separate <laughs> offices for a reason. So, so we know we know when not to enter that space. So we we know how to 
to give each other space. That's very, that is very significant if you want to keep the love going, even in a relationship. <laughs> Wonderful. And what inspired you to start a radio station for women? Um, I have to tell you, the influence of my family and of seeing all the, the different challenges for the successes of women around me, of being around my friends, of having gone to convents and realizing in talking to women who were in business trying to get ahead that, you know, we have a sisterhood. We're there to support each other and maybe the time was right to show that sisterhood in a different way and to amplify the sisterhood by having this radio for women, which really started off as being a, a form of support. Yeah. Right. I mean, Lifetime Television was already out, but nobody had done radio for women. And and in fact, I went to Capitol Hill, you know, and spoke yeah. on Heartbeat Radio because the Alliance for Women in, in Media, which was based in D.C. at the time, they couldn't understand you know, how a radio station, I guess, in Trinidad had started. And they they invited me and, you know, I spoke at, at their breakfast reception. But Wonderful. the thing is, the thing is, I think we don't realize how important the voice is to us, to everybody, yeah. but women more so. We remember our first kiss. We remember our first dance. We remember the first crush we had. You know, things that men take for granted, but <laughs> by and large, women don't. You're laughing, and I know that's because you remember all of your firsts, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so even the logo, when we no, couldn't I don't. come up with I don't. I'm going to say I don't because I don't want anybody asking me about it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not going to speak you off now about that, about how you respond to that. But anyway, <laughs> so even the logo, when we had to design the logo, the one thing we found every girl has drawn is a heart. Mm. You know, and okay. um, heartbeat was just, a, I guess, a natural thing for us to, to call the station. And so it started off as radio for women, but we had re- Read, redone the slogan, added to it actually, and the men who love them. Yeah. And that wasn't my idea. That was a male listener who called because we do have a lot of male listeners. Yes. And he kept me on the phone, I think, for almost an hour. And I always give people this joke because the thing is, I, I don't know his name <laughs> up to now. I just can't remember his no. name. But he gave me a one hour airful of why this is radio for women and the men who love them because he felt that a lot of the shows we had done and the lifestyle topics that it allowed him to have better relationships with his wife and his daughter Lovely. and he said he had so many friends who listened to it you know and and i said okay and i you know at that night i just laid on my bed thinking well why not we can't exclude the men this is a way to include them Yes. And um, and that's how it became Radio for Women and the Men Who Loved Them. And it stuck. I love it. I love it. I think that's such a, a good a good tagline tagline anyway. So that time that you are presenting on Capitol Hill, was that your proudest moment? No, my proudest moment was looking at my son. <laughs> I was holding my son in my arms. That was that was my proudest moment. It will always be my proudest moment. Yeah. Um, and he has made me, he's a young man now, he's 23, nice. he's an exceptional young man, he's, you know, I always tell him if I was a young girl, you know, <laughs> he wouldn't get in a way, but no, he's a gentleman, you yeah. know, and I think that's because he's around his aunts and, and his grandmother and myself, but that was my proudest moment. Wonderful, wonderful. So with all of this female energy, you never felt the need to go back for the girl? No. <laughs> I was very happy with my with my boy. <laughs> I really wanted a boy because I grew up around so many girls and um, God blessed me and I had my boy. So what's your advice for your son? Same thing. Don't ever give up your dreams if you think you can um, stomach the sacrifice and you can qualify your passion. Just don't give up. And that is my advice actually to, to any and everybody. You know, I, I say this very often when, I, when I'm doing any kind of speaking engagement, which is be a warrior, not a warrior. Be a W-A-R-R-I-O-R, -R -R, not, not a W-O-R-R-I-E-R. -R -R. Yeah. Um, it makes a very big difference. You hear people talking about manifestation, 
and you know and people think oh it's all this new age thing this manifestation go no this is about what you set your mind to Mm. that is so important and i think not enough people understand the power of their subconscious mind and how what you think and what you say manifests itself and and how important it is to, to talk to yourself in a particular way, to talk about the things that you're doing in a particular way, to refer to yourself in a particular way. I was uh, talking to somebody this morning. I had a bit of a setback with my, I, I, with, with my running. And I, I, I say to my friends all the time, I said, I am an athlete and I might not look like an athlete, but that doesn't matter what anybody else perceives me to be. I believe myself to be an athlete. So it means that it isn't that I run sometimes, it is that I'm an athlete. So it means that if I'm having trouble running, then I have to do something else because I am an athlete. It is who I am. And just acknowledging that and, and figuring out what is the person that you want to be and making sure that you speak that into being. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that is something that I think people feel you can't think that way if you come from a certain environment where, you know, you don't have a lot of the leisures that other communities have. But that's not true. Because I know a lot of people who are very positive, and because they are so positive, wherever they are, they rise up. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're able to overcome what whatever stands in their way. You know, but you have to do it in the interest of the highest good, yeah. as well. You know, and that is why I think giving back is so important. So you know, whether we give assistance to to nonprofits through doing PSAs for them or or literally going out there or connecting them to people. I mean, the thing is giving back is so important because I believe in karma as well. And I think that it does come back, but do it for the right reasons, whatever you're doing. Yeah. Do it because you think it's the right thing to do, not because you think it's going to come back to you because then then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, what... What do you think we need to do to get more diversity at the leadership within within Trinidad, within the Caribbean, within the globe? What do you think we need to do? Mentorship. Okay. Mentorship is very important. Um, I also think we need to create spaces where people feel comfortable to interact. Um, that's why I believe in the work that you know business um, associations do. So things like the Chamber of Commerce, I think it's very important mm-hmm. because you want to understand where you have to survive and what's happening in business. But I think mentorship is very important as well. And so you don't have to have a mentorship group or, ma- or a mentorship committee. If you yourself as a leader give back, you know, at least one hour a week to somebody who's young or somebody who wants to learn you you would have given back a lot because as i said a little earlier no book is going to prepare you a lot of what i learned was not the books a lot of what i learned to to get me to where i am today it is from interacting with people who are wiser than me i was smart enough to listen to them you have to be willing to listen so it's a two-way street If you do decide to mentor, to impart your insights and experiences, the other person has to be as receptive and open. Do you have to agree with everything? No, you don't. Your gut will tell you what you want to agree with or not, but you will learn. You will at least learn the other perspectives. And I think that that is a key thing we are missing throughout our world. Um, It's a very necessary thing. And I think one of the things that we don't do enough of that we realize in the pandemic is staying connected to the people who mean something to us. Yeah. So how do you how do you go about mentorship? Is it that you seek out other people or they seek you out? People sometimes call me um, in, in the case right now. I have two mentees who. They just called me and asked me if they could call me up sometimes for advice. And I told them, sure, um, I am part of a mentor, a mentorship group, though, that is run by a fabulous lady called Georgina Terry, you know, <laughs> and um, she, this is her second time recruiting me, but, you know, but I'm very happy to do that. Or sometimes um, there are young people who will just come and say, or call me and say, can I talk to you for 15 minutes? Yeah. And, and once I'm not busy, or even if I'm busy, I reschedule with them, even if it's for a weekend, just, just 15 minutes. I think sometimes they want to know they're on the right path yeah. and they want a little bit of reassurance. So, I mean, mentorship takes many forms, mm-hmm. you know? 
And what about when you were mentored, you know, at the Chamber of Commerce and, and all of the people that you mentioned who sort of sought you out for mentorship? Was it that you went to them and said, can you give me some advice? Or how did that work? Was it that they just said I that always, you okay. I always ask for advice. Okay. If there's something, I'm one of those people. If I don't know something, I will ask. Okay. And if I feel I want guidance, I will ask. The most I will get is a no, yeah. right? But I will ask. Um, and I will continue to do that. I don't think that will ever change about me. I don't have... I don't have a, an ego that that's, you know, that's inflated, that will stop me from doing so. Um, and so I've never had anybody say to me when I ask for help, say to me, I don't have time, I can't speak to you. Yeah. Even when I was doing just sales on main roads, you know, and just wanting to talk to a client to get insight, they've never said no. And, and I think that we have to realize human beings are helpful. Yeah. By nature. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we are helpful creatures. We like, you know, if somebody says, um, I need some help, your first instinct is to help. Yeah. You know, as and so you can, yeah. Yeah. And and so that's um that's that's one of the, the good things I think about um what I've done in my life. I've never had that air about me where I didn't want to ask. Um, and the chamber, definitely, not just the staff, but the board of directors and the past presidents, and they, they're warm, fuzzy people, you know, believe it or not, they're warm, fuzzy people, and they really know what they're doing, you know, and it's a great, great um, environment to be in. Wonderful. So, and, and my last question to you is, what is your hope and wish for the future? Um, I hope that professionally in terms of, of Trinidad and Tobago as my country, I hope that, you know, government and civil society can work more collaboratively to bring about the, the positive change that I think we need. I think we have some holes that we need to fill and some bridges we need to build together. Um, I am very concerned about, you know, some of our people and our communities and and the lack of diversification. And I see young people and entrepreneurs who are so talented and so brilliant not have the, the tools that they need, not that they won't learn, but they just don't have the tools, you know. And I think that's why I've become so involved in the chamber because I want to find a way to ensure we continue to support them in particular. Um, but I think that that is one of, one of the things on my wish list. Right. Um, I also think that um, as people coming out of the pandemic, I hope that we realize how important we are to each other for our own survival yeah. and that um, we will be more tolerant and more understanding of each other, because I think it's, it's the only way that we're going to develop and grow to be able to face the battles that we have coming at us. Yeah, and, and reach our potential. I think we are always just on the verge of extraordinary potential, unrealized. Very true. So once we do all of that, it means we'll be working in the spirit of excellence and we stand a better chance. Absolutely. What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Kimran. I really appreciate um, getting to know you and getting to talk to you. And, and I'm delighted to know that we're both sort of mentors with, uh, in Georgina's program. And, and it's been incredibly rewarding for me. I've learned so much about a number of different things. So I think it's great. But thank you as well for, for listening today and to, um, supporting us through this process of, of building our, our leadership acumen and, and learning from each other and sharing our stories and looking at uh, leadership through a very diverse lens. I think it's really important that we understand that leadership comes in all shapes and sizes and colors and genders. And hopefully we inspire more of you to pursue leadership and understand that it takes all of us to build the, the beautiful and, and wonderful future that we have in mind. So thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.